Welcome back to This is Van Color. My name is Mo Amir, and our featured guest tonight is a community organizer, climate activist, and a founding member of One City Vancouver, a municipal party right here in the city of Vancouver. Along with BC Minister of State for Infrastructure, Bowen Ma, she just launched Politics for the People with Bowen and Boyle, a six-part podcast miniseries on demystifying politics. She is a Vancouver City Councillor, and she's up for re-election this October. She is Christine Boyle. Christine, so nice to see you. Thanks for having me on again. Of course, my pleasure. The spirit of Politics for the People, your new podcast with Bowen Ma, is about demystifying politics. So I'm curious, for you as an elected official, when people come up to you, what are the common misconceptions they have, either as constituents or just British Columbians in general, when it comes to politics, governance, or even their relationship with the government? It's a great question, and there are so many <laughs> a podcast worth of them. Absolutely. Uh, but the one I think about the most is... Um, this idea people have that their voice doesn't matter that much, that government has already made decisions uh, and uh, and that their input doesn't count. Mm -hmm. um, because in reality, certainly at the local government table, I see so clearly how much public input shapes the decisions that we're making. Right. Not just who signs up to speak, but who shows up to public events, who's engaging in the larger process. It shapes decisions council makes, it shapes the policies before they even come to council. So it sounds like there's a lot of cynicism that people don't actually believe that they have autonomy or influence over government processes or politics in general. Totally. And I think that cynicism really serves the status quo. Mm -hmm. um, and so you could suggest that it uh, it's intentional in a lot of places. <laughs> you know, people yeah. are reluctant. People are busy. Their lives are full. Um, and it's already a lot to ask to show up and engage in the process. And when people here are made to feel that it doesn't matter what they have to say, they're less likely to show up. And so uh, we don't hear from an accurate representation of residents and mm -hmm. things don't change in the way uh, that I think they should or the way that would benefit the most people. One of the things that you cover in the podcast is people's entry into politics and you weave your own personal experience in, into this and you identify how outrage being mad at something the government is doing is often an entry point for a lot of people. And I would say that that kind of intersects with your own personal social network. So if you have friends or, or people in your community that are organizing or that feel the same way that you do, then oftentimes that entry into political participation is, is there and people exercise it. What I see, though, in the last 10 years or so is that there are a lot of politically engaged citizens, participants, but they're only engaged online. So you see the outrage online and you see even the social networks online. Is there a problem with being politically engaged, but it being exclusively limited to just being online on Twitter, on Facebook or other social media networks? I think online engagement is a great entry point, but it can't stop there because that's not where real change happens. So mm -hmm. if you get fired up about an issue online, great. Um, the next step is to take it offline. And for those of us who are organizers who are interested in social change, it's our challenge too to give people ways to take that activism, take that passion uh, from the online sphere into organizations, communities, uh, the political sphere, whatever that might look like. Real social change needs to be are more Are you broad telling that? me that my tweet with 100 something likes... Look, does has no influence on politics. It's one piece, <laughs> but it can't be the only piece. The other reason that I think it's important that we take online activism into communities and into the real world um, is because we can get so siloed online mm -hmm. and it, um, it reinforces our idea of who we are and who other people are uh, in ways that I think can be harmful for community and democracy and our own mental health. So sure. there's a feminist author I like who says people are hard to hate close up. Uh, and I think that's an important <laughs> reminder mm -hmm. uh, of why it matters that we gather together with people we may not agree with every single thing on because mm -hmm. um, a, our, a healthy civic life 
includes talking to people who aren't the same as us. Absolutely. And let's delve into this a little more, because on the first episode of your podcast, you describe Vancouver politics as being particularly toxic. And I assume you're talking about particularly online discourse in Vancouver politics. What did you mean by that when you characterized Vancouver politics, which you're engaged in, you're elected in as being toxic? There's a level of discourse in Vancouver politics um, that uh, that can get quite mean. Um, unique to Vancouver, you think? Um, but I I don't think it's unique to Vancouver. Okay. I experience it in Vancouver. <laughs> sure. Um, and I think about it a lot because of how often I hear from people who I think should run for political office mm. that that's a barrier for them. That the, that they don't think they have thick enough skin. Um, that they don't think they could handle that. And so they stay out of a place where I think their voices would be uh, really important. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it worries me for that reason. Um, but we've seen in this last year as well, uh, places like Victoria and Squamish, where far right Facebook group, far right funded Facebook groups are launching anonymous attacks on, mm. on sitting councillors and mayors. Um, so I, uh, I experienced it in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. um, the podcast speaks from our own experiences, but I am um, very aware uh, of how challenging it is for, especially for women politicians in many other places. Sure. Too. And I think that's an interesting point because that online discourse, it's easy to brush it off and say, oh, it's just online, but it does create serious barriers of people who don't want creepers going through their Facebook photos and making memes of them and, and doing things like that that are you know, they cross the line of just political commentary. They're they're very toxic and disturbing. Yeah, sometimes. it keeps good people out of politics. You know, we've seen far too many examples of uh, uh, of good leaders stepping down early, not running again mm -hmm. um, because of the harassment they experience online or who are you speaking about around? Uh, uh, so the stories from Mumalak, from mm, Jody Wilson-Raybould, sure. um, but also the mayor of Victoria has been mm -hmm. pretty frank about the online harassment and the toll that it takes. Um, I, I'm grateful for more and more people airing those stories. And I think it reflects the loss uh, for all of us of these good leaders. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. I always have a, a blast chatting with you. So I appreciate your time. I'm glad to be here. Folks, that was Vancouver City Councillor Christine Boyle. For our full interview, find This is Van Color wherever you listen to your podcasts, as we will be discussing the scope of responsibilities for municipal governments here in BC and just what the heck is happening at Vancouver City Council. Council. And make sure you find Politics for the People with Bowen and Boyle while you're at it. Now stick around because after some business, I'm joined by a very special guest, a friend of the show. We've talked about her already tonight, sort of, and she's here to defend the honor of the noble Easter Bunny. Well, actually, the super serious debate about the super serious things is up next. My name is Mo Amir. This is Van Collar.